The Rambam lists off 13 Ikori Hamuna, and I'll be speaking tonight about the eighth. We believe in Torah Min HaShemayim, that the mitzvahs that we observe were given Min HaShemayim by HaKadosh Baruch to the Jewish people. On the occasion of Maimon HaSinai, HaKadosh Baruch only proclaimed to the Tzibur the Aseris Adibros. The rest of the Torah was told to Moshe Rabbeinu, and he transmitted it to Bnei Yisrael. But we all know, we have a historical tradition, not just that it's written in the Chumash. There were Shishim Rebo Jewish people present at the time of Maimon HaSinai. There were Shishim Rebo men between the age of 20 and 60. There were probably Shishim Rebo women also between the age of 20 and 60. Then there were many people younger than 20. There were many people older than 60. And then there was Erev Rav, Gerim. So there were several, there were over a million people, several million people witnessing Maimon Hasina, who told over this story to their children, to their grandchildren, to their great-grandchildren. And the story goes like this, Moshe Abena was a kvad pet. He, he didn't speak normally. And when, when Moshe Abena told over the dinner to Bnei Yisrael, he spoke in a booming voice, or the Kim Yan he spoke in a loud, booming voice, and he said over the dinner, without a kvad pet, he was speaking normally. So the people realized that this was Shechidim Adaberis Mitoch Grana. It wasn't Moshe Abena's own voice. So they knew that he wasn't making up the dinim. Not only were the Aseris Adibas given in Hashemaim directly to the, all of the several million people present at Har Sinai, all the mitzvahs that Moshe Abena told them during the course of the 40 years of traveling in the Midbar, it was clear to everybody that wasn't Moshe Abena wasn't waking it up and wasn't making it up. It wasn't his voice. It was Shechina Medaberis Mitoch Granai. And the Parsha says, and let's speak, Sedra, when Moshe Abenu said over the Dinan to Bnei Yisrael, his face was shining, Koran open and Moshe, but the people could take it. When he finished saying over the Dinan, his shining face was annoying the public, so he had to wear a mask all day long. When he spoke to the Shechina, he took off the mask. When he said over the Dinan to Bnei Yisrael, they were able to take it. It didn't bother them. But then, as soon as he finished saying over the dinim, his shining face was so hurtful. It, it was so painful. So Moshe Rabbeinu had to wear a mask that people couldn't take it. So this is why B'nai Yisrael, the several million people who constituted B'nai Yisrael at that time, during the 40 years in the Midbar, they were all convinced that this was Torah and Hashemai. Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't making anything up. Not only did they, were they convinced that the Aseris Adivas were Min HaShemayim, the rest of the Torah was also Min HaShemayim. So we observe, we, we believe in Torah Min HaShemayim. But the Ramah added on a few words of it. The Torah, as we observe it now, as we observe the mitzvahs now, what does that mean? So I'd like to explain. Herman Wook wrote a book, The K Mutiny. So Herman Wook taught two years in Yeshiva College. He taught literature. So he told the students that the theme of the book, The Cain Mutiny, is that authority is binding even when it's an error. The captain of the ship and the people thought that he was he made a wrong decision. And it's based on a Rashi and Chumash, where it says he was a learned fellow. His grandfather had a shul in the Bronx. I remember for a, for a while, my family lived in Philadelphia and the day school in Philadelphia only went to the fifth grade. So my parents had to send me to New York for the sixth grade. I had to stay by my grandparents. Most of the other children in my class whose parents wanted their children to have more learning uh, after the fifth grade sent them to Baltimore. And my parents sent me to New York because my grandparents lived in New York. So Herman Wook's grandfather had a steeple down the street from my grandparents in the Bronx. So he told the students in Yeshiva College many years ago that the theme of the book is based on Rashi al Torah. The Pasuk says, if there's a dispute among the Rabbanim in town and it's causing friction, if some Rabbanim say us and some Rabbanim say muta, okay, so that's not a problem. So that people in one city will follow their rabbi, people in the other city follow their rabbi. Even if the two shuls in the same community, if there's no friction, so let those Balabatim and that shul follow their rabbi. The Balabatim and the other shul will follow their rabbi. But the Chumash says, if there's causing friction in the community, 
then you can't leave it like that. You can't just leave everybody follow their rabbi. You have to present to Shiloh, to the Bezna Hagodol, to the Sanhedrin and Yerushalayim, whatever they pass can is binding. And the Torah has the expression, You're not allowed to deviate, not to the right and not to the left. So the commentaries explain that some people think that the Bezna Hagodol was a little too lenient. That's called left wing, left wing Supreme Court. Or they think the Bez Nogal was a little too machmer, a little too strict. That's called right wing. So you're not allowed to deviate, not to the right, not to the left. Whatever the Bez Nogal passes, you have to follow. So Rashi quotes from the Sifrei, from the Tanoim, commenting on the Pasuk, an, an additional level of interpretation in that phrase, Loisasa Yom in a small, even if the Bez Nogal made a mistake. And they tell you, you mean shoes small, while small shoes you mean. They tell you go left, and it's really right tell you to go right and it's wrong. It's really, you should really go left. The Psak is binding even when it's an error. And that was the theme of his book, that authority is binding even when it's an error. So one of the students broke Mr. Wook's heart, Herman Wook's heart. And he told him that that can't be Pshat and Rashi because the din is not correct. The opening Mishnah in Hyria says explicitly, even if there was a unanimous vote of the Supreme Court, Court, the Bez Nagorl Shabib Shalim, the Sanhedrin, all 71 members passing in one direction, and somebody knows for sure that they're making a mistake, he's not allowed to follow the Bez Nagorl. So it cannot be that that's Pshat. The first one to raise that issue with this difficult comment that Rashi quotes on Chumash from the Sifre is the Ramban. The Ramban, in his commentary on the Seif Mitzvah, poses this contradiction. The opening Mishnah and Hariya says, that if you know that the rabbi made a mistake, you're not allowed to follow the rabbi. And Rashi and Chumash quotes the Sifre that seems to say the opposite. So the Ramban thinks that there's a word missing in the Sifre. What it should say is, even if you as a layman think, in your opinion, you think, even if you think the rabbis are making a mistake, a lot of times, a, a person who's not knowledgeable will think the rabbi made a mistake. It's sometimes it'll be counterintuitive. The rabbi said does make sense. Sometimes the halacha doesn't make sense if you're talking about common sense. Biology doesn't always follow common sense. Chemistry, physics doesn't always follow common sense. Halacha also a lot of times common sense plays a role, and a lot of times it doesn't uh, doesn't follow common sense. So the rabban thinks that that's the pshat. And this is certainly true. The Torah is a Torah semis. Rabbi Chaim Balazhana was the most outstanding, famous, most famous student of the Vilna Goyen. We have a collection of chubas <coughs> by Rabbi Chaim Balazhana. It, it's in a sefer called Chut HaMeshulosh. We have the first section of the sefer has chubas by Rabbi Chaim Balazhana. And then the second and the third sections are by chubas by his sons-in-law. One was Rabbi Leza Ritche, Rabbi Leza Yitzchak, one was Rabbi Hilo. So in several, quite a few of the chuvas are Abchaim and he he will sign off. Kel emes noson lana teres emes ubilt the el emes einenu. Hakadosh Bocha gave us a teres emes, and when we figure out a chuva, we're trying to figure out what is the truth of the Torah. What did Hakadosh Bocha instruct us? <clears throat> if the psak is an error, you're not allowed to follow that psak. That there is no such thing. The story is told, it, uh, we're on our way to Purim, the story is told that uh, Rabbi Simpson Rafael Hirsch had a Realschule, he had a school in Frankfurt for the German Jewish children. And Gratz, the one who wrote the history book, was a student in that school. So Gratz later on uh, gave up a lot of uh, the Ikori HaAmunah. He didn't believe in Torah, Shabal Pem, and Hashemayim. He thought it was all made up by the rabbis. Among other things, that's how the story goes. Gratz didn't believe that the story of Purim was true. Even though it appears in Tanakh, he thought that it was not historically correct. Nonetheless, he would, like a good yeke, he would come to shul on Leal Purim and he would listen attentively to the Megillah to every word. So they say that Rabbi Samson Rafael Hirsch approached him and he said, what are you bothered to come to listen to the Megillah for? The whole, according to Europe, in your opinion, the whole story of the Megillah is a, is a novel. It's a fairy tale. So what? A, why should you listen to the Megillah? The whole thing is based on a mistake. So he said, no, no, it's a takonah's chachamim. Whatever the chachamim made a takonah, you got to follow the takonah. That's not so. If the rabbis made a mistake and the whole story of Purim never happened, it's a Baba Maisa. So you don't say a bracha 
Shas and Nisim Labas Ediyonta. You don't make a takan if the whole thing is a mistake. There are Jewish professors of history who are convinced that the Nes Chanukah never happened. The victory against the Hashmanaim were victorious in battle against the those of the Avodah who had used the Beis Hamikdash for Avodah purposes. But the story that that is history. But the story of the Nes of the Pach Hashem and that the Menorah burnt for eight days in a row. So there are professors who think that it never happened. And nonetheless, they, they will like their Ischanike meticulously. And they'll say the Bracha Shas Anisim. The Gemara says, why did you say the Bracha every night? Because every night there was a continuation of the Nes. It wasn't just one Nes the first day. This is, this is not correct. If you're convinced historically that the miracle never happened, you're not allowed to observe such a mitzvah. The rabbis made a takana based on, based on a mistake. So that's not Torah min Hashemayim. That's a human error. <clears throat> that's not proper. There are Jewish history professors who are convinced that the, the Amaroim misunderstood the Tanoim and the Rishonim had the wrong girsa, the wrong text in the Gemara, and the Achrayim misunderstood the Rishonim, and everything in Shulchanach and everything in Halach is all based on error upon error upon error, but the Halach is binding anyway because that's the Halach. There is no such thing. Whatever is based on an error, you're not allowed to follow. We follow the Torah because we are convinced. Not just we believe that at one time there was a term in Hashemite. We believe that the way we observe the mitzvahs today is what was told to Moshe Abenu. And if it's not, and if we think that there's really a mistake, then you have to change it. You're not allowed to leave all the mistakes. How can we possibly be so convinced that the Torah, as we are observing it, is accurate. Look, human beings are all fallible. Everybody can make a mistake. In the Avodah religion, that's uh, popular here in America, they believe in a principle of infallibility. They believe that the head of their um, head of their clergy is infallible. They uh, made up this uh, idea a few uh, while ago. For many centuries, they never had that uh, principle of infallibility. They keep on changing their animamans. So we don't, we don't believe that any human being is infallible. We have a parsha in the Chumash of Parhelem Dovish al Tzibor. If the Bezna Godel, the Sanhedrin in Yerushalayim, made a unanimous vote mistakenly to allow to be Mater Anisa Kores, and Reiv HaTzibor in Eretz Yisrael, 51% of the Jewish population living in Eretz Yisrael, violated an Avera that has Kores, because of the mistaken psak of the Bezna Godel, then instead of requiring from each and every person who violated the Isa B'Shogig that he or she should bring a korban chatos, we say that Bezna Godel brings one korban, par halam dovish al one chatos, and everybody gets a kapar. We don't know if, if such a thing ever happened. I doubt we have no historical record that the Bezna Godel ever brought a par halam dovish al It's very rare that 71 rabbis should say the same thing ever. There should be an unanimous vote among 71 rabbis. That's highly unlikely. And it's highly unlikely that they'll make, all 71 will make a mistake. And then it's highly further, highly unlikely that 51% of the tzibu will go along with it. And they'll all violate the Issa because they thought the Bez Nagot of Psak was, was correct. The whole thing is so far-fetched, it probably never happened. But on the books, HaKadosh Bochu told us right down in, in Chumash Vayikra that there's an institution of Parhelam Dovish al Theoretically, it's possible for the entire Bezna Godel to make a mistake on an Issa Kores. Theoretically, it's possible that uh, 51% of the Jews living in Aristotle will follow them and they'll make a mistake. I don't think it ever happened. I don't think there ever was Lamaisa or Parhalam Dovish Tzibur, but on the books we have it. On the books in the Chumash and Parsha Shmini, we read that Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest Tamachacham, Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest Tamachacham we ever had. He made a mistake. And Aaron disagreed with him, and Moshe Rabbeinu said, you're right. He gave in to Aaron that they're not permitted to eat the chatos in the state of Aninus. They were only permitted to eat kotche shor, not permitted to eat kotche doiras, not permitted to eat the soy rashchidosh in the state of Aninus. So human beings are all fallible. People can make a mistake. So whenever I ask my rabbi Yoshaila, I'm obligated to follow his psak, or whenever I yes to Bezna Godel Shaila, all of Klal is obligated to follow their psak. Maybe everybody's making a mistake. How can you say, how can you say that the Torah as we observe it today 
is we believe that that was given to Moshe Abbein and that it's actually Torah Min HaShemayim. Maybe the rabbis kept on making mistakes upon mistakes upon mistakes, generation after generation, and everything is a big mistake. So the Gemara raises this issue. So the Gemara says, we have a pasuk in Tehillim that reads, Sod Hashem of Riso Lahodiyam. We believe that the psak of the rabbi is binding because we should assume that he's not making a mistake. We believe that HaKadosh Baruch will give a divine assistance to the Tamachacham that he shouldn't make a mistake, provided the Tamachacham is a Yirei Shamayim. So Hashem, the Yirei HaKadosh Baruch will reveal the secrets of his Torah, the true secrets of the Torah to those who fear him. So when Aseluch Arav, when one has to pick a rabbi to follow all of his psakim to ask you have to pick a rabbi who's intelligent, who seems to be learned, and one who has Yirei Shamayim. Because this promise, Sayyid Hashem Lirev, only, app- only applies when the person has Yerah Shemayim. So Psak is binding because we assume that the Tamachachim probably had a divine assistance to Paskin correctly, not to make a mistake. How can this is a problem, though? The Gemara raises an issue. How can that be the case? How do you ever have a Machloikis? HaKadosh Bocha gave a divine assistance to Rabbi Kiba to say in one direction, gave a divine assistance to Rabbi Shmot to say in the other direction. So the Rabbi Shalom is talking out of both sides of his mouth at the same time. How can it be? So the Gemara says, yes, we have an idea. You have to understand the idea that Elu Elu Divre Lekim Chaim. A lot of times, not always, sometimes you have a machloik is what the facts are. Was it A or B? And it's mutually exclusive. Then you don't say, you can't apply Elu Elu Divre Lekim Chaim. If you have a machloik is Amaroyim, what did Reb Meir mean in the Mishnah? You have a machloik is Rishayim, what, how to read the Girsa in the Gemara. One is correct, the other one is not correct. You can't apply Eloi and the Divi Lekim Chai. But in many cases, when you have a Machlekes, Aliba then Abshai, Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Shmuel had a disagreement. How to understand the Aloche? So we say Eloi and the Divi Lekim Chai. What does that mean? So the Ritva, that Gemara, that expression appears in the Gemara in Erevin at the end of the first Perakon, Daf Yud Gimel Amen Bey. So the Ritva has a famous comment there that. When Moshe Rabbeinu was on Har Sina, HaKadosh Baruch was telling him all of the 613 mitzvahs. So Moshe Rabbeinu probably asked, what's the din in this case? Rabbi Shalom says, it's mutter. What's the din in that case? In that case, it's asa. What's the din in the third case? HaKadosh Baruch often told Moshe Rabbeinu, that's a great area of halacha. There are elements of isa, elements of heter, elements of chiv, elements of ptur, elements of tuma, elements of tahara. And I leave it up to the, up to the, uh, understanding of the Chach Meha Torah Shebchol Davador to Paskin according to their understanding. And you can have different perspectives. E- each person may have a different perspective. Let's say if you have a room full of people, so the person and everybody sitting by a, a chair and a table and so on, so the one who's in front of the room looking at speaking has one perspective of the whole room with the fixtures and the walls and the people. One sitting all the way in the back on the right side has a different perspective. One sitting all the way in the back on the left side has a different perspective. People are standing at different points, so they have different perspectives. So on halacha also, you can have different perspectives, and each one from his own perspective is correct. So there is a concept of Eilu Eilu Diva Likim Chaim. So we believe that the psak of the Tamachachim is binding because we assume, Soed Hashem Lirei, we assume that the Tamachachim had a divine assistance that he shouldn't be making a mistake. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will grant him a siyayt adishmaya, that he should be a mechab and al ho'emes. The story is told about the Nodi Behuda, Rabbi Cheska Landau, who lived in the 1700s. He first was a rabbi in a small little village, in the same village where the Baal Shem Tev lived. He was related to the Baal Shem Tev by marriage. They got along together, even though the Nodi Behuda was opposed to the whole movement, the whole Hasidish movement. He has Trubis in his Sefer, but he's not happy with the Hasidish movement. But then later on, the Nadi Bihu was appointed to be the rabbi in the big city in Prague. So when part of the background of the story is whenever they would appoint a rabbi in a big city, there would usually be a big machloikis among the Balabatim in the city, whom to appoint. Someone would want his son-in-law or his cousin or his great uncle, a relative of his to be, or mechutna of his to be the rabbi, and uh, the majority would win. And the one who would lose, the one whose candidate uh, wasn't accepted, would always be sour about it. 
So the story is told that uh, soon after Nari Buddha was appointed as the rabbi in the big city in Prague, one of the Balabatim who voted against him, one of those who didn't want him to become the rabbi, he knew that, that that Balabas was against him, decided to show the Balabatim that the rabbi does know how to learn. So he knew Yeridea Hilchas Trefus, he knew which diseases in the animal make the animal a trefa, even if you shecht it, you're not allowed to eat it. If you don't shecht it properly, it's called an avela. If you shecht it properly, but it's a diseased animal that has a hole in the lungs, a hole in the kishkis, so then it's a trefa. So, uh, so the trefa is only oser if it had the disease while it was alive. So in the slaughterhouse, they shecht in an animal, and this wise guy, this balabas, knew Hilchas Trefus, so he took one of the inner organs and he punctured a hole in such a way that it shouldn't be noticeable. Usually you can tell whether the hole was made mechaim if the, if, the, if the hole in the inner organ was made while the animal was alive, then the blood is circulating. So there's going to be a lot of blood over there. If the hole was made after the animal died, after the shechit that took place already, and the blood is no longer circulating, so there isn't going to be any blood over there. So he did it, he was a wise guy, he did it in such a way that you couldn't detect that the hole was made after the shechita was over. And he made a hole in such a way that this case is not discussed, not in the Gemara, not in the Yeridei. So he made believe that this was a real Shiloh from the slaughterhouse. He came with a few other Balabat and from the slaughterhouse to the rabbi's home to show him the hole in the organ. So the Nadi Yehuda took the Yeridei and he started looking up the din. He was missing the pages, missing, 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 and he couldn't find anything. And he, after a few moments of thinking and missing the pages back and forth in the Gemara and the Yeridea, he slammed the Yeridea shut and he pointed at that one balabas and he said, it's a fake. There is no Shaila. You made, you punctured the hole after the Shechita took place and there's no Shaila. And he kept on screaming at him till the balabas admitted that that's true. So the Balabas, they asked him later on, how did he know that that was the case? So he said an interesting, the famous story. He said, whenever he paskins a shayla, whether muta or osa, he always feels very confident that he had a divine assistance, that he shouldn't make a mistake. So did Hashem Lireyev. And on this occasion, he felt lost. And he didn't understand why does he feel so uncomfortable to say muta? He knew the Gemara, he knew the every day. This case is not described, not in the Gemara, not in the Shulchan, not described. So it's mutter. Any animal, all animals are kosher, unless you can, unless you know that it's a trephus. If it's not mentioned that this is a trephus, then it's kosher. So he didn't, he was wondering himself, why does he feel so uncomfortable to say that the animal is kosher? The case not discussed in the Gemara. So he was missing the pages, he wasn't looking for it in the Yeridei, he wasn't looking for it in the Gemara, he knew the Gemara, he knew the Yeridei, the case is not mentioned, he was trying to stall off to figure out why does he feel uncomfortable, it's an open and shut case, no shine. so he realized that this divine assistance that he usually has, and he always feels confident that his psaq is correct, this divine assistance is really a miraculous thing, it's a Nesman HaShemayim that he gives the to the Shemayim, the Rebbe Shalom only makes Nisim when they're needed, if it's not needed, you're not going to make a nest. So obviously it must be that there's no shaila over here. You don't need the nes men hashamayim to have a siyatu. How come there's no shaila? But they brought, they innocently brought the inner organ from the animal with a puncture in it. There is a shaila over here. So he thought, he kept on thinking, he said, ah, this is the balabas who was on the tzad shekeneged. He's the one who voted against me. He probably punctured the hole after the shechita took place to show, and he knew that it's not discussed in Yeridea just to embarrass me, to humiliate me, to show that I don't know how to pass on any shalos. That's why he was so confident, so he slammed shut the Yeridea, and he said, the whole thing is a fake, it's a fraud, there's no shaila. They made the hole after the animal was geshochted. There's another issue in paskening a shalos. Not only can people make mistakes, people sometimes have negias. People have an agenda. A lot of people have an agenda, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, subconsciously. So the Gemara has uh, a, a discussion. The Torah, usually the, the halacha says, you're not allowed to rely on a miracle. You have no right to assume that God is going to make a miracle. There's one parsha in the Chumash, one and only one parsha, where the Torah says we can rely 
on a miracle from heaven to Paskin the Shilas. What is that? The Parsha of Soto. If a couple is married and the husband is suspicious that his wife is having an affair with someone else, and he warns the wife she shouldn't be alone with that person, so and she and she is alone with the person, even if she didn't violate the prohibition of Yichud. Let's say there is no prohibition of Yichud if the, if the if a woman is with with her own brother or her own father, or or in she's alone with another person, but by the year her husband is in the city, he works in town. And he's a five-minute walk away from the house. So then we assume the woman is not going to be having an affair if her husband is in the same city. So even if there's no violation of Yechud, but if the husband wander in advance, don't be alone with that person in the house because he's chayshed her, he, he, he mistrusts her, he thinks that she's, she's fooling around and having an affair with the other person. So then he's not allowed to continue living with his wife until he brings her to the base Amigdash and she drinks the Maim Hamorim. So the Maim Hamorim are not poisonous. No one should die, no one should get sick. They don't taste good. It doesn't taste good. You put in something bitter and you put in a little sand, but that's not a reason not to die and not to get sick. And nonetheless, the Torah promises a miracle. If the woman is guilty, she'll at least start getting sick and ultimately she'll die from drinking of the water in the base Amigdosh. And if she's innocent, the choice of an Igzra Zara, even if for many years she was married, she never had any children, a miracle will occur and she will be blessed with children. And if she had sickly children before, then she'll have healthy children afterwards. So this is the one and only case where the Torah promises a miracle. So the parsha begins with the word, Daber al-Bnei Yisrael. So the, take a look in Yeridea, the first comment that the Shach makes on the first page. In Yeridea, in the Nekudus HaKesef, so the Shach raises an issue that, Whenever that phrase appears, Dabel, B'nai Yisrael, sometimes the rabbis will comment, B'nai Yisrael, V'lo, B'nai Yisrael, the din doesn't apply to the women, only applies to the men. And sometimes the rabbis will understand, Dabel, B'nai Yisrael, V'lo, Gerim, the din doesn't apply to Gerim. So in this parsha, the parsha of Soto, if the husband is suspicious that his wife is, uh, is uh, acting improperly and she's having an affair with someone else, so the Tanoim made it Russia, this miracle was only promised if the husband is a natural Jew. But if the husband is a Geir, the miracle was never promised. The, whole, the, the Haftoche doesn't apply. And then, Shmai, and then it was quoted that during the times of the Beis Amik, the Shmai Ve'avtalyon, in the beginning of Pirkei Ovis, you have a lot of Mishnahis, one after the other, after the other, list of the Zugos, a list of two names together. So the Gemara says in Chagiga that all of those Zugos mentioned in the Mishnahis, the first name mentioned was the chief rabbi, the Nasi. The second name mentioned in the Mishnahis was the Abbezin, the assistant chief rabbi. So you have Hill of the Shammai, well, from the Zugos, Hill was the chief rabbi, Shammai was the assistant chief rabbi. And then you have Shmai of Abtalion. So Shmai Avtalion were either the Rambam writes in his commentary on Pirkei Avos they were themselves were Gerim, they were non-Jews who converted, and the Taisus Yanto thinks that it must be a mistake. How can it be if they were Gerim? How could they be appointed members of the Sanhedrin? It must be that they were descendants of Gerim. But the Gemara says that they didn't speak Hebrew well because either they themselves were Gerim, so they were used to a, a, a different pronunciation. People, Americans, find it difficult to pronounce a ches and uh, certain pronunciations in Hebrew uh, you, can, you can't pronounce. So either they were Gerim or they were descendants of Gerim. So there was Akavya ben Mahalalel made a comment. That's one version in the, in the Mishnah. Akavya ben Mahalalel made a comment. Yes, yeah, Shmai and Aftalion were descendants of Gerim, they themselves were Gerim. So of course they had an agenda. So of course, they're going to pass on everything in the favor of Gerim, to give equal rights to the Gerim. All, all the rights and privileges that Jewish people have, the Gerim should have also. So he made such a disparaging comment about Shemai Rav Talion that they paskined halacha, that a woman married to a Ger has a dinner that has the parsha of Sota, because Shemai Rav Talion had an agenda that they themselves were from, from descent from Gerim, that's why they favored the Gerim. So the Mishnah says they put the man in Gerim for saying that. You're not allowed to say that. We believe that an honest, the goodness, Tamachach and Paskins and Shabbos without any Nagiyah. If a person has a Nagiyah, he's Pasal We wouldn't accept this testimony. 
But uh, if you're talking about paskening a shaila, even if a person has a negia, we assume that he's going to pasken the shaila above negias. This year is a shnas hashmita, and this coming sukkah, following the shnas hashmita after Len, there's going to be a big question whether it's permissible to use a srogim that grew in Eretz Yisrael, where the farmers relied on heta mechira. The question is that the Gemara says in Masech HaSukkah, an esrog is only acceptable to be used for the mitzvah if you are allowed to eat it. So the farmers who rely on the Hetem Echira is very questionable whether, whether the Hetem Echira is valid or not. So many are not happy. Hetem Echira was people think that Rav Kook invented it. Rav Kook didn't invent the Hetem Echira. Rav Cook, when he first came from Europe in 1901, Teretz, whenever it was, no, it was before, when, when he came to Eretz Yisrael, uh, he, originally he came to be the rabbi in Yafo. Then later they appointed him as the chief rabbi, but originally came to Yafo. The rabbi before him in Yafo was a, Greek, a big tzaddik and a big bal kabbalah. Uh, I forgot his name. He was the one who published the Siddur Hagra with a lot of kabbalah in it. So he was the one who, who would, would take care of the Hetem Echira for those farmers who wanted to in those years. And when he passed away, that was part of the job description that we're looking for another rabbi to take over the Rabbonus in Yafo who will follow through with the Hetem Echira. Hetem Echira was from the 1600s when there were no Ashkenazim at all living in Eretz So it was introduced by Svarda Shegdoilim and it was based on a psak of one of the Rishonim, the Sefer HaTruma, Sefer HaTruma, Rabbein Baruch, one of the Balei HaTesvis, from centuries earlier. The Vilna Goin quotes the Sefer HaTruma and Simon Shin Lamar Aleph, this Sefer HaTruma. So it's a, the Heter Mechira is an old, an old Heter. You know, Rav Kook is not the one who instituted it. He was not happy about the Heter Mechira. In fact, he died of cancer, and at the end of his life, he suffered a lot. And it's quoted, that his contemporaries quoted that when he was on his deathbed and he was suffering a lot, he said it could be he attributed possibly to the fact that he was doing the Hetem Mechira. He was not happy with Hetem Mechira at all. But the whole question really is Hetem Mechira for the farmers, that they should do the work on the farm or they should even allow non-Jews to do the work on the farm in Shnas Hashmita. What about for the consumers? Is there an issue for the consumers? So... The Rabbeinu Tam, Rashi's grandson, writes in Tesis on the last daf in Yevamis, Tesis quotes the Rabbeinu Tam as saying that if someone kept the fence up around his farm and he wasn't mafker, he didn't declare, he didn't open up the fence to make the peris that grow in Shemitah year, they have Kedusha's perishes, he didn't make them hefker. So Rabbeinu Tam says that the consumers are not allowed to eat those peris. So many held that those who rely, the farmers who rely, and there it's all over 95% of the farmers rely on Hetem Mechira. It's less than 5% who, who uh, observe Shemitah. It's very unfortunate. The Chazanish and other G'daylem over, over many years since uh, the Jews started to move back there at Sisu in the late 1800s, many G'daylem were encouraging the farmers to observe Shemitah and they didn't get too far. It's less than 5% to observe Shemitah, unfortunately. <clears throat> so that's going to be, a, that was a big debate. The esrik to be kosher for the mitzvah, dalaminim, has to be yeshbo heter, heter achila, has to be kosher, muta to eat. So according to Rabbi Natam, a farmer, if you, hold, if you don't hold from the heter mechira, and the farmers kept the fences up, and they didn't, they weren't mafka, they were esregim, so you're not allowed to eat esregim, so those esregim possibly are puzzled to use for the mitzvah. So Moshe Feinstein has a tshuva, if I'm not mistaken, it's the very last tshuva in the first volume of the Igris Moshe, Chelek Arachayim. And he explains why it's not a problem. Rabbi Soloveitchik said exactly the same as Moshe Feinstein. So I remember years, years ago, when I was a teenager, so the Yiddish newspaper was read by many people. So when it was the end of a Shemitah year, towards the end of the Shemitah year, when it's time for people to buy a Shreigim, so there'll be two advertisements on the same, they used to have a lot of advertisements in the Yiddish newspaper. It used to be a daily. Now it's only a weekly and hardly anybody buys the weekly Yiddish newspaper. So nobody reads Yiddish anymore. But at that time, they used to have two advertisements near each other on the same page. The Mizrahi put in an advertisement 
The Rabbi Zalavechik said this year, as every year, it's a mitzvah to buy an esrig that grew in Eretz Israel. And, and don't worry about the fact that last year was Shemitah. It doesn't pose a problem. And, they, and the Satmar Hasidim would put in an advertisement that the Satmar Rebbe said that this year, because it was a Shemitah year, you're not allowed to use the esrigim from the farmers who relied on the Het Mechira. So a lot of people would say, we could have said with our eyes closed, that the Satma Rebbe was opposed to the Zionist movements. Of course, he's going to say that you're not allowed to use the Esrogen. And Rabbi Salvechik was the honorary president of the Mizrahi. So of course, he's going to say that this year, like every year, you're allowed to use. So that's really apicursus. They're, they're saying that both the Satma Rebbe and Rabbi Salvechik were fakers. They're not honest to goodness, Tamir HaChacham. They just say a Psaq Halacha based on their pos political position. Each one has an agenda. And they're Paskin and Gashala based on their agenda. The Satma Rebbe was a holy tzaddik. Rabbi Zalavechik was an honest person. They were honest people. They weren't fakers. The Psak has nothing to do with Zionism or not Zionism. It's, it's, it's totally unrelated. You look at Ramosh and Feinstein's Shuba, totally unrelated. The Chazanish said, Mikiradin, we don't Paskin like this, Rabbi Natal. That's Mikiradin, it's Mutter, it's not a problem. So that's really, so that, that, one who says like that, that's Rabbi Salvechik, Paskan Lohokel, because he's a Zionist, Satma Rebbe Paskan Lachman, because he's anti Zionist, he deserves to be put in Cherem. That's what the Gemara, the Mishnah says that they put a Kavya Bema Halalal in Cherem because he, because he, he imputed this, uh, this attitude to Shmai Vaptalyan, that they Paskan that an Aisha's gear has the dinam of Maim Hamarim. Um, because they themselves were Gerim or descendants from Gerim, and they felt uh, they, they had their agenda. They wanted to give the Gerim the equal rights to everybody else. You're not allowed to say such a thing. We assume to honest to goodness, throughout all the generations were above Nigias and they passed in Shilas with honesty. The Gemara comments on the Pusik and Parshas Bereshis, Zez Sefer told the Sodom. That's the beginning of the Pusik. So the simple translation of the word sounds like it's telling us that either Chumash Bereshis or the whole Chumash or Chumash or the Chumash is a history of mankind. Zeh Sefer told us all. So the Gemara says that doesn't make any sense. If the Chumash is a, a history book of mankind, how come everything is out of order? The Gemara says, it's not in chronological order and it's missing a lot of information. What kind of a history book is that? So the Gemara has a different understanding of the Pasuk, Zeh Sefer told the Sodom. When HaKadosh Baruch Hu created Adam Arishon, the Rabban Shalom had an agenda when he created the world. He wants the world to lead, ultimately, Limos HaMashiach, that it should be Malchias. All of mankind should accept the Malchus of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. All the nations of the world will recognize HaKadosh Baruch Hu as the Melech HaElem. That's what Malchias is all about. So the Gemara says, HaKadosh Bohu is behind the scenes. He's seeing to it that the history of the world will develop the way he wants it to take place. And the history of development of the halacha for the Jewish people, the development of the Torah in every generation, you have Talmud HaChamim, that in every generation, he will see to it behind the scenes, what Hashgoch protest that the Psak HaLacha will be the way he wants it to turn out. So the Gemara says that Zeh Sefer told us Adam, HaKadosh Baruch showed Adam Arishan. Adam Arishan was created on Rosh Hashanah. Be'echa b'tishrei nibah ha'olam Rosh Hashanah, the world was created. Which day of Sheshit Esmei Bereshit was that? So our tradition has it that Rosh Hashanah, that Adam Arishan was created, was the sixth day of Sheshit Esmei Bereshit. It was Friday. The way we have the calendar now, Rosh Hashanah never falls out on Friday. Lo adu Rosh. So the Kabbalah swarm right because the world is imperfect. If it would be a perfect world, Rosh Hashanah would always be on a Friday. We don't need any proof that the world is imperfect. It just, they read the newspapers. The whole world is ready to fall apart. So, uh, so Rosh Hashanah never falls out now on a Friday, according to the calendar that we have now, the system we have. But the original Rosh Hashanah, when Autumn Rishon was created, that was the sixth day of Shesh Hashanah. The first five days were considered prehistoric, because there was no human being there watching the Bria. And the first day, historical day of the Bria was the day Adam Rishon was created. So on that day, 
on that the Rosh Hashanah, the day Adam Rishon was created, HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed him a Sefer. Ze Sefer told us Adam has dar dar b'doshav, dar dar b'chacham of dar dar b'sofer. HaKadosh Baruch Hu showed Adam Rishon what's going to be in the future, how all of history will unfold itself, how the halacha will be developed over the generations, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu will see to it. The Gemara tells this story in the context of the story of Rabbi Shmuel. It's an interesting story. Rabbi Shmuel were both the first generation of Amorim, Rabbi Uranasi was the last generation of Tanoim. He's the one who edited the Mishnayis. And then the first generation of Amorim, Rabbi Shmuel, Rabbi Yechon, and many others. So Rabbi Shmuel were living in Eretz Israel, but they had family who lived in Bavel, and they felt bad for the Jews in Bavel. The Jews in Bavel were very religious, but they were not learned at all. So they were violating Shabbos, Kashvis, Taras HaMeshpacha. They didn't know anything. But if you would tell them a din, they would observe it. Not like uh, many Jews in America, they're ignorant of the dinim and they don't want to know the dinim. You tell them the dinim, they don't want to observe it. No, the Jews in Bavel were religiously inclined, but they were Amaratzim. So Rabbi Shmo were living in Eretzot. There's a mitzvah to live in Eretzot. They felt they both had an obligation to travel to Bavel to establish yeshivas. Each one went to Bavel, different city, to establish yeshivas. And the whole picture changed. The whole scene changed and there was a tremendous learning, more learning in Bavel than there was in Eretz Yisrael for a period of time because of Rabbi Shmo. So Rav wanted to get smicha before he leaves Eretz Yisrael. His real name was Abba. But because he got smicha, Rabbi Uranasi gave smicha to Rav, so they called him Rav. He's the one who got the rabbi. Shmo did not get smicha because every day Rabbi Uranasi was busy with something else. Something came up every day and he couldn't give him smicha. Then, and the boat was leaving. So he had a, Shmuel had to leave to Bavel. He left to Bavel. Once he leaves to Chutzlart, he can't receive smicha. The one is conferring smicha, the one is receiving smicha, have to both be in Eretz Yisrael. They don't have to be in the presence of each other. You can send a letter to someone else, I'm conferring smicha on you, but they both have to be in Eretz Yisrael. So the moment Shmuel left Eretz Yisrael, went to Bavel, so that, that was impossible. He wasn't able to receive smicha anymore. So, so Rabbi Ranasi felt very bad why he was unable, because of circumstances, he was unable to confer smicha on Shmuel. So someone told him, don't feel bad. I saw sections of this Sifr Shalad Marishan. That's what it says. The Rabbi Nishlam told Adam Marishan on day number one, the day that he was created, that he has a plan in the world. And in one generation, there's going to be Rabbi Shmuel. Rabbi is going to get smicha. Shmuel is not going to get smicha. Then it's going to be Ravina Ravashi, it's going to be Sefai Ra. And the Rabban Shalom told Adam Arishan how he's going to see to it over the generations that the halacha will be, will be developed. So we believe that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, from behind the scenes sees to it that there shouldn't be any mistakes in halacha. And whatever there are, sometimes there are mistakes made, those mistakes are corrected. Over a period of time, the mistakes will be corrected. Many people are familiar with the Mishnah Brura. The Chafetz Chaim started a whole project with a few members of his family, and they worked, different people worked on different sections of the Shulchan Aruch, and then the Chafetz Chaim was the general editor. He, over, he was overseeing the whole project. So the Mishnah Brura reverses the Psach HaMekubo practically on every other page of the Shulchan Aruch. For many centuries, the Psach was one way. Then the Mishnah, Mishnah Brura reversed the Psach. In every generation, they were reversing the Psak. That's what the commentaries are for. On the Rechaim, you have the Magan Avram and the Taz. On Yerodeh, you have the Taz and the Shach. They're always reversing the Psak. People made mistakes in the earlier generation. All the mistakes were corrected. In fact, there's an unbelievable story. A Jew, about 40 years ago, bought an apartment in Manhattan from a non Jewish person. And the non-Jewish previous owner said, there are a couple of books there on the floor. If you want them, keep them. If you don't want to throw it out in the garbage. I have no interest in it. So the Jewish person looked at one of the books. It was a handwritten book. It turned out that it was the original manuscript of the Shach, his commentary on Chosha Mishpat. And there are several places in the Shach on Chosha Mishpat where the sentences simply don't make any sense at all. And no one understands what he's talking about. When they found this manuscript around 40 years ago, they reprinted the Chosh Mishpah with the Shach, with the corrections. What happened was, unbelievable story. What happened was the Shach wrote in his handwriting, his commentary, and then he wanted to add a line 
in the middle of a sentence. So he put an asterisk in where he wants to add the line. And then he wrote a few lines on the side of his commentary that was written. So he meant that the whole sentence that he wrote on the side of the commentary belongs at that point. The one who set the type didn't understand that. So he wrote as if the added comments on the side of the commentary are the beginning of the sentence. So in a few lines in a row, he put out a couple of words that didn't read straight. He was supposed to put the whole comment that was written on the side in one place in the commentary. So after, after so many, the Shach died in the late 1600s. So finally in the late, after 300 years later, they finally found the original manuscript of the Shach in Manhattan. Nobody knows how it landed up in Manhattan. And they finally reprinted the Shach and Chaysh Mishpah for many years. They were just offsetting. They were just reprinting everything that was exactly the same, the same page. And now they had to set the type anew because of these uh, 10 places where the, where the Shach didn't read straight at all. But in every generation, the Chachamim are reconsidering everything and reversing the Psak. You have in the days of the Tanaim, you have Mishnah Rishayna and Mishnah Achrayna, Bezin Shalach Reim Amru. They're always reversing the Psak. HaKadosh Baruch has ceased to it from behind the scenes. The Gemara says, Lo Bashamayim here. HaKadosh Baruch is not going to give a prophecy and not going to send a Baskal out of Paskal Nishayla. He's not going to do that. But behind the scenes, HaKadosh Baruch has ceased to it that the Aloha should be established in the correct fashion, the way he wants it to be established. So that's what the Ramam lists off in the eighth of the 13 principles of faith. We believe, not only do we believe that at one time there was a Torah in Hashemai, we believe the Torah as we observe it today is a Torah Semes. This is the Torah in Hashemai, that whatever mistakes were made over the generations were, 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 were corrected, and some of them are yet to be corrected, and we are observing the Torah, it's a Torah Semes not a Torah Sheker. As far as the text of the Chumash, there are quite a few places in the Chumash we're not sure what the correct spelling is. We have the word Petsua Daka, and we're not sure whether it's spelled Daka, Dalet Chafalaf, or Dalet Chafei. And uh, another uh, 15 places where we're not sure exactly what the reading should be. So that, that we're not sure. We have the Aleppo Codex, and we're not so sure whether that's, uh, that's more reliable than ours. We're not sure. So that's, the Ramam isn't talking about the text of the Chumash. Text of the Chumash, Taka, there are a few places, but we're not sure what the correct reading is. But the Ramam is talking about a Torah HaMetsuya ought to be ordained the way we observe the mitzvahs. We are observing the mitzvahs. It's not that there was a Torah in Hashemayim, and in every generation mistakes were made on purpose or accidentally or with agendas, subconsciously, whatever. No. If mistakes were made, we believe in Hashemayim, Kodesh Bochu will see to it that all of those mistakes should be straightened out. And the, and the mitzvahs, as we are observing them, are the way Rab Chaim Vadoshan has said, Kel Emes, Nosan Lona Taras Emes, Ubilti El Ha Emes Einen. Good evening, everybody. Okay.